Hello. First of all, I want to thank each of you for tuning in to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel again. Uh, your support is greatly appreciated. Let's pray before we get started. Lord, we thank you for continuing to teach us through your written word. Uh, we pray that your word will come alive in us and cause a clear realization of how our sinful actions can hurt you and bring consequences upon us that we must live with. It is in Jesus' powerful name that we pray. Amen. As uh, we've been teaching for a while now about uh, what the Bible has to say about uh, what defiles a man. And our focus scripture has been Mark chapter 7. And um, usually I read from verse uh, 14 through 23, but tonight I'll just uh, read verse 20 through 23 for the sake of timeliness. Mark chapter 7 verse 20 says, And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts and sexual immoralities, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All of these things come from within, and they defile a person. Uh, our focus story this week comes from 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 14, a very familiar uh, passage of scripture, I believe, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 14 reads, How be it, because by this deed that thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. So those are the verses, that's the story that we're focusing on tonight. Now just a reminder of uh, some, some of the things that we've covered uh, already that uh, fall under the heading of what defiles a man, uh, and, and, and I've just read them and we're focused uh, uh, on slander. And we've been uh, here for, uh, this will be our third week on this subject of slander. Slander is a false tale or report maliciously uttered, tending to injure the reputation of another person. The malicious utterance of defam defamatory report, uh, the dissemination of malicious tales or suggestions to injure another person's reputation. The greatest slanderer of all is the devil or Satan the adversaries of God's people, and he's the accuser of God's people, as well as being God's adversary. Now, slander is prohibited in the ninth commandment, which says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Uh, week before last, uh, we encountered the story of how Satan attempted to slander the good name of Job. God declared in Job chapter 1 verse 1 that Job, he says, this, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Satan questioned why Job served God so willingly. Satan inferred that God and Job had a contract that kept the blessings flowing if Job kept serving God. Satan continues to make that kind of accusations against God's people today. He thinks that we only serve God for what we get from God. And I must, uh, uh, in a standoffish way, acknowledge that when you observe our prayers or our commitment to obedience to the Lord, that would seem to be the case. So we must be careful at, 
at, at how we convey our reason for serving the Lord. We must take the attitude that Job had. He says, uh, uh, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. In other words, Job is saying, if the Lord is giving, if the Lord is taking from me, blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord's name makes me happy. And then he says, uh, though you slay me, yet will I trust you. No matter what is going on or going wrong in our lives, we must learn to trust the Lord through it all. And then uh, another attitude that Job uh, 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 gave us is that even when Satan is allowed to test our motives for our relationship with God, we must learn to, to be patient and wait on God. He says, all of my appointed days, I will wait until my change come no matter what we're going through in life that whether we're whether satan has been allowed to afflict us to to take away uh the things that bring us joy to to afflict our health no matter what we're going through we must always remember that god is going to bring us through whatever he brought us to and we can say like Job, all of my appointed days, I will wait until my, my change come, until my circumstances change. And then last week, we focused on Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, where Jesus himself is attempted by the devil. Now, just as God had already spoken about how he felt about Job, in, in, a, in last week's lesson, uh, God had already previously spoken about how he felt about Jesus. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Satan used the if factor to shed doubt on Jesus' kinship to God, if thou be the son of God. And, and, and he does that to shed doubt on our kinship with God, to, 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 to question whether God really cares about us. It appears that Satan is uh, not bothered by what we say or what man says, but by what the Lord says. And that's a good reason for us uh, when we preach, when we teach, when we witness, in words or in deed that we become comfortable with saying and being told what thus said the Lord, because Satan cannot handle effectively what the Lord says. In our struggle, we tend to prefer opinions over what the Lord says about our predicament. But we must be careful that we don't turn word deaf ears to what God says and fail to heed his warning that we find in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. It, it reminds us that for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching or doctrine, but will have itching ears and they will accumulate, store up for themselves teachers to suit their own passion, to tell them what they want us here. Tell them how good they are. Tell them that they're going to be rich. Tell them that they're going to be healthy all of their lives. And that's not what God said. What God brings us to, he will bring us through. He will give us, he will make a way for us to escape. Grandmama used to say the Lord will put more on us than we can handle. Now, tonight we'll focus on the purpose of slander, which is to bring discredit or shame upon by one's actions. What we do has a bearing on how God's enemy perceive God. So therefore, our perception and our the way that we live must be in accordance with will, God's will and his way. Now, when we see stories like we're going to look at tonight, uh, or today, whatever, you, whenever you're listening to this YouTube message or lesson, uh, it's not our duty as believers to attempt to palliate 
uh, the crime of saints in scripture. In other words, our duty is not to make a disease or its symptoms or sin less severe or unpleasant without removing the cause. We must learn to call, call sin, sin, and to see it as the Lord sees it. We must take our lead from God. God sent his prophet Nathan to confront David with his sins. And this is precisely the course which the scripture pursues. And this is the course which Christians or believers ought to pursue in speaking about such characters as David. In the ordinary course of things, their crimes uh, would have been in great measure concealed, but God would not suffer these offenders to escape. And might I say there are those in society today that think that just because they fail to acknowledge God in their lives that God will not hold them uh, guilty of their offenses. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 14, our focus verses says, how be it? Because by this deed, thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. So in this, we find that uh, the warning that comes out of being careful of how we live. Now, now there are a few things about that leads us up to uh, our focus verse. Second uh, Samuel chapter eleven verse fifteen says, in the letter uh, that uh, King David sent back to the front line by Uriah, it said, put Uriah on the front line where the fighting is fierce, and then pull back and leave him exposed so that he's surely to be killed. That's point one. David was guilty of murder, and also he was guilty of adultery with Uriah's wife. That's why he, uh, uh, in essence, put a contract out on Uriah's life. He had the soldiers to 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 uh, move Uriah up to the front of the fighting where everything, where the real fighting took was taking place, and then he, he gave instructions for everybody to pull back. David should have been on the front line, or at least leading the charge or the battle, but he was not. Uh, Verse 27 of chapter 11 says, Then when the period of mourning was over, David sent for her after, you, after Bathsheba had finished, had, she had gotten the word that her husband had been killed in battle, and after she had went through the proper period of mourning, then David sent for her and brought her to the palace, and she became his wife. And she gave birth to a son, but the Lord was very displeased with what David had done. Uh, now, let me give, give us a, a, a rundown of exactly what the Bible says happened. In verse 1, chapter 12, it says, So the Lord sent the prophet Nathan to tell David this story. There was a well, there was two men in a certain city. One was very rich and owned many flocks of sheep and herds of goats, and the other very poor, owning nothing but a little lamb that he had managed to buy. And it was his children's pet, and he fed it from his own plate and let it drink from his own cup. In other words, this little ewe lamb was very precious to this poor man. He even cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. And recently, Nathan says to David, a guest arrived at the home of the rich man. But instead of killing a lamb from his own flock, 
for food for the traveler, he took the poor man's lamb and roasted it and served it. Now David was furious. I swear by the living God, he says, any man who would do a thing like that should be put to death. He shall pay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the rich man in the story. The Lord God of Israel says, I made you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. In other words, Saul was the king, but then God got angry at Saul and fired him and didn't even tell him he was fired. God took his spirit from uh, Saul and Saul didn't even know about it. And then he sent uh, Samuel to anoint David to be king. Now David was his father was the shepherd of his father Jesse's sheep. And what makes David unique is that David encountered, uh, while keeping tending his father's sheep, he, uh, there was a bear and there was a lion uh, that came to try and, 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 and take uh, his father's sheep from him and devour them. But David was willing to put his life on the line, line in order to save the sheep. Now that's a type of Christ because uh, fast forward to the New Testament, Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, came and laid down his life for the sheep of his father, which is God. In other words, he laid down his life for us. He says, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Now, David went on, the story goes on, uh, Nathan says, you are the rich man. And the Lord said, I made you king over Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you his palace and his wives and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the law of God and done this terrible and horrific deed? For you have murdered Uriah and stolen his wife. Therefore, murder shall be a constant threat in your family from this time on because you have insulted me by taking Uriah's wife. Therefore, I vow that because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you, and I will give your wives to another man, and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, but I will do to you openly in the sight of all Israel. And, and right there, I'm not finished with the story, but I just want to interject this. We must, in this day and age, be careful what we think we're doing in private because God might flip the script and do the same things to us or allow somebody to do the same thing to us in public. Then David says, I have sinned against the Lord. He confessed. He was confronted with his sin by Nathan, and now he confesses to Nathan. And then Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you. Woo. And you won't die for this sin. But you have given great opportunity for the enemies of the Lord to despise and blaspheme him. In other words, to drag God's name through the mud. And, and, and here's the, the penalty, the consequences of his sin. Your child shall die. 
Then Nathan returned home and the Lord made Bathsheba baby deadly sick. And David began, uh, begged him in, uh, to spare the child and went out uh, without food for days. And he laid all night before the Lord on the, ba the, the, on the bare earth. And the Lord of the nations plead, uh, the Lord of the nations pleaded with him to get up and eat with them. But he refused. He lost his appetite. He lost his ability to lay down and go to sleep. And then on the seventh day, the baby died. And David, aides were afraid to tell him. He was so broken up by the baby being sick. They said, we, what will we do? What will he do to himself when we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw them whispering, he realized what had happened. He asked them, is the baby dead? Yes, they replied, he is. And then David did something unusual that we need to learn to do when we find ourselves confronted with our sins and after we have confessed our sins. David got up off the ground. And he realized that he got up off the ground and then he washed himself. He, he brushed his hair. He changed his clothes. And then he went into the tabernacle and worshiped the Lord. And then he returned to the palace and ate. He went on about his business. If I was preaching a sermon at Mount Sinai today uh, about this, this scripture, my three points was, would be that David got up, David washed up or cleaned up, and then David looked up. And we must learn the importance of when, when instead of sinking in our misery, we need to learn to, to, to get up and stop, uh, uh, what do we call that, wallowing in our sorrow. We need to learn to, that there comes a time when we must get up. When we realize there's no more we can do by, 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 by being sorrowful, we need to learn to get up and then clean up. Clean up means get rid of the filth. David went to the Lord in prayer. He says, according to the, thy love and kindness, uh, the multitude of thy tender mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me with hyssop. In other words, make me white as snow. And he says, uh, uh, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. And, and, and he says, I need that because I, in, in sin that my mother conceived me and, and I was shaped in iniquity. So I need you to to, to, to work on me from the inside out. Make me a new creature. He says, then I'll teach transgressors thy way and sinners shall be converted unto thee. I'll live a life that's a good example for others to see that will not bring, give your enemies occasion to blaspheme your holy name. And he says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. When David went into the temple, he looked up and he worshiped God because he realized that it was not all over. And each circumstance, a situation that God brings us to in order to take us through it, we need to learn that there comes a time when we need to go back to worshiping God instead of wallowing in our pity parties. So we must learn that salvation is not of works, but it, it's only by God's free grace. Romans 6 and 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, 
but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but shall have everlasting life. So let us learn this lesson from, G, from, from David that we should be careful not to live lives that will give God's enemy an occasion to blaspheme his holy name. Well, that's it for today or tonight. Uh, thank you again for joining us. I realize that you had other options, uh, other things that you could have been doing, but I'm so appreciative that you uh, decided to spend a few minutes with us as we uh, share uh, what thus saith the Lord. Take care and we'll see you next time. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that you will give the increase so that what we've heard will affect the way we live. Make us mindful of the fact that our actions, whether they're good or bad, has a bearing on what your enemies say about you. So we pray that you would order our steps in your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So long.